Hi, this is Rick Schmidlin. I'm the producer of the re-edit of Touch of Evil. I'm sitting here with Janet Lee and Charlton Heston, who has given me the honor to be able to call him Chuck during this uh, commentary. And we are going to discuss for the next 111 minutes the production, the history, and the re-edit of Touch of Evil. Chuck, what do you have to say about the beginning of this project? Well, the beginning of the project is, of course, before we got to make the film. I was... Uh in Michigan uh, at Christmas, and I'd taken two or three scripts with me to read. And they said, uh, what do you think of the, have you had a chance to read that yet? And I said, yeah, it's a, it's a police story, and it's uh, okay, but you guys have been making police stories for 30 years, 50 years, so who's gonna direct? And they said, well, we've got Orson Welles to play the heavy, and I said, why don't you have him direct? He's a pretty good director. <laughs> and they, they seemed uh, surprised at that, but in the end they gave in, and uh, here we have the beginning of a remarkable film. What do you remember about this? Um, Janet, what do you remember about this night? Well, this night I remember uh, that <laughs> we were there uh, all night um, to make this one ex you know, extraordinary shot, um, and uh, it, it just was tedious and long, but we knew that it was a historical uh, shot because of the, the length and no cutting. And uh, and this, well, I, I think I should let uh, Chuck tell you about our one <laughs> nemesis on this shot was this poor man. Um, why don't you take it from there, Chuck? Well, it, uh, of course, the shot is enormously complicated, enormously difficult to do with a Chapman boom as they had them then. You could do it with a Python boom. Uh, uh, an apprentice could make the shot, but not then. And it was, as Janet says, further complicated by the fact that uh, as you get to the uh, uh, the border crossing. As, as we're approaching now, and it's been yeah, going yes. on for all this time. Yes, and uh, here we see Janet and me walking across the street and approaching the border and uh, we see the car, which plays a significant role in the scene, passing us, and we're uh, chatting, as I remember. And then when we get to the, I, I play a Mexican narcotics official. And we're on our honeymoon. We're on our honeymoon. And the people in the car now have dialogue there. Then uh, finally we get to the, I think we get pretty soon, to the I love I love the goats there. Oh yes, they're and the music is of course a marvelous contribution to the uh, to the whole. Gives and the whole feeling of a border town. Yes, here we are. Yes, this poor man. <laughs> yes, and he has uh, some dialogue not with us but with. Uh, or, no, it's the other border, isn't it? No, he, he. Yeah. By the way, the gentleman in the car, his name is Jeffrey Green, and. There is no book that deals with this film that this character's name is in. No. So that's Jeffrey Green <laughs> with Joy Lansing. Joy uh, Lansing was the girl. Right. Yeah. Here we are. And, and that border guard uh, had a terrible time remembering his lines. All night long he had a time remembering his lines. And finally, as you can see, the sun is beginning to just dawn is breaking. That was the last time we could possibly do the shot. And Orson said, we'll do one more take. And then he said to this guard, he said, uh, this time, don't you say anything. Just move your lips and we'll post dub it. But for God's sakes, don't say, I'm sorry, Mr. Wells. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the shots you see printed there, he was not really speaking at all. Okay, well, I want you guys to watch something here. I believe this is probably Rusty Westcoat. Watch the shadow against the wall right now. Mm -hmm. Who does that look like? It looks, it looks like, like Orson. Clinton. It looks like Orson, but Orson was directing, so yeah. it must have been uh, Westy Westcoat, which is double. By Might the way, that uh, explosion was shot on the lot in June. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a pickup shot. Sure, of course. They wouldn't do it down in Venice. And coming up is one of the first changes that is one of the slightest ones that we made. So well, except that there are no, uh, no uh, credits over the opening shot. Except for that. But, I mean, one of the yes. slightest changes within the, into the film itself. But surely the, one of the grossest errors the studio made was using this great shot as a background for the, the credits. Exactly. Okay, <laughs> watch this with the two yeah. of you here. It's a smooth transition now. When, uh, Janet, when you cross uh, from Chuck... 
Right. And what happened originally was it was a very sloppy cut. Right there, it's very smooth. Before, the cut was very choppy, and it gave a very, very cheesy kind of beginning, which now is not there. Walter just said it needed to be trimmed by three frames, and Ah, Wells was talking about the uncommercial cut. Mm -hmm. There's Mort Mills uh, that just walked in. And uh, coming up will be Joseph Cotton. When you see Joseph Cotton, listen to the voice because it's not Cotton's it's not Joe, voice; huh? it's uh, Orson's voice. For heaven's Orson sake. did the uh, Joe's voice. Orson did Joe's voice in the first shot. Uh, I talked to Phil Bowles, the AD on the film, and Phil Bowles told me that Orson had a constant war going on with one person uh, in this film, and it was the sound mixer, Frank Wilkerson. And he would constantly make his life miserable by saying, don't worry about getting the sound now. We'll get it later. And he would ask for cars to make noise and anyone to make noise on the set so he could have the chance to go back in and redo it. And he said he was the only enemy on the set. I never knew that. No, nor I. Yeah. Valentin de Vargas here. um, Wonderful performance throughout this film. It is a nice shot. Oh, so, you know, the, um, mm-hmm. we're, intru- we're being introduced to most of the characters within the first reel that we'll uh, learn right. about. And this is, all takes place in basically 24 hours' time. That's right. It's, uh, well, now, here's where the intercutting starts, isn't it? Uh, the intercutting will start when, uh, when we Arson cut gets... back to um, the, the hotel room. Here's Ray Collins, who yeah. st- w- was one of the original Mercury Theater players. He's very good uh, in this. Yeah, very good. He was in both uh, Citizen Kane, where he was uh, Wells' nemesis. Um, he was in Ambersons. And too. he was in Ambersons as well. And Joanna Moore. Okay, here's yeah. here's uh, Wells' voice. Yep, you're right. You can recognize the tam of Orson's voice now that you point it out. Joanna Moore was really a blonde. Uh, uh-huh. Orson, uh, I guess, insisted that she change her hair color. Well, that's why, because when, we looked at the, when I looked at the credits and I said, I don't remember Joanna Moore being in this. And then, of course, I, I, didn't, I didn't remember because she was, uh, had dark hair. Well, here comes Hank at last. And here comes the great entrance. Um, Wonderful entrance. Yeah, I mean... I'd like to meet him. That's what you think. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there he is. Flawless entrance. <laughs> the thing I kept, I keep telling people is that um, because he later in life became, you know, the, rather heavy, as we all know, uh, that they think that this is the way Orson actually looked. And, of course, it, it was not true because he was padded and uh, applied makeup to make him look this way. You could say he was a little plump, but... <laughs> But certainly not like this. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, he had pillows, and but you know, yeah, later no. in life, unfortunately, he did get. Uh, oh yes, that's too bad. If yes. you, true. If you have a chance uh, to ever take a look at the Fountain of Youth, which is the television thing he did for Desi Lou after, you have a real good view of what a 42-year-old Orson Welles looked like in 1958. Mm-hmm. By the way, this cut actually came after the scene of the explosion, and now this is the first intercut in the film mm-hmm. uh, that we've changed for the re-edit. By the he way, wanted to keep both stories alive. Akim Tamirov is a very valuable addition to the film. Oh. Wonderful job. Brilliant actor, and he was also in, uh, he worked with Wells on Don Quixote, he was in Mr. Art Carden, and he was in The Trial as well, later on. Mm-hmm. With uh, Orson. With Orson. Yeah. Uh, Tamirov was of Russian descent. He was born mm-hmm. in 1899 in uh, Russia, and uh, his training came from the Moscow Art Theater. It was very good. I remember in the uh, rehearsals, Chuck, um, that a lot of the interplay with uh, Akeem and myself came out of that, those rehearsals. You know, it, it wasn't as um, written as much as, as it, it, it became later. He was all, by the way, he was also this nominated. Very good bit. Yeah. J- Janet has here. My husband, yeah. And if you're trying to scare me into calling him off, let me tell you something. <laughs> 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 Delicious. But he won't be. 
No, Tamarov was na- never uh, nominated for the General Died uh, Dawn, yeah, and also for Whom the Bells Toll. Yes. Now, now we're going I back to, to what the intercutting that that kept the both stories alive, right, Rick? Yes. Now this is back. This is actually would have uh, continued, and your scene would have come after this. But this is where the intercut comes back. Again, as you can see, it's now keeping both stories very much alive yes, because it's, it's two a, separate stories. Uh, no, it's a, it's brilliantly done. It really is. What? Well, no, Wells really. He he just wanted to make this picture a stronger film. He did not want to make it an artier film, and you know. Well, he it was a rough film and 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 biting and cutting. You know, it was it was not a, a smooth, pretty f- movie. It's a very dark picture. Exactly. A great deal of it is at night, of course, right. which is part of that. Well, Russell Meddy, cinematographer, his early training came, uh, he worked in the labs before he became an assistant cameraman. I didn't know that. And um, he went on to, uh, for Spartacus and... He did another, a couple of films with me, uh, The Warlord, Frank Schaffner's film. He was also the uh, cameraman on, on The Stranger that Orson did in yes. 46. Uh, watch this. Here's another change here. Watch Orson's eyes. In the uh, earlier versions, uh, Wells was looking down when he looked back at you, and he said, to get this point across, I have to look directly at Vargas. I can't be looking down. So that was a little digital fix that we had to do so that he's looking directly eye to eye with you. You're looking at him in the eyes, and when you cut to him in the the, uh, preview version of the release version, he's looking up. See, but here again is where you you're keeping the two stories side by side, which is uh, uh, I think it makes it so much more interesting because you see what's happening to each of the couple uh, as you go along. Well, and you keep uh, keep them in the audience's memory too if you keep cutting back and forth. That's yeah. This um. Film, by the way, uh, it was originally uh, released in 1958 mm-hmm. as a short 90 in the 96 minute version. Uh, in the 19- lower Hedy Lamar picture, wasn't it? Um, the double bill? it, it played with the, uh, several pictures, but it always wound up at the bottom of the double bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1975, Bob Epstein at UCLA found a 108 minute version, and uh, he was screening it for a class and realized that there were missing scenes and reported it to Daily Variety that he had found the long, uh, the missing long Orson Welles <laughs> cut. And so that's where the myth came that that was Welles' cut. But that's not true. In yeah. reality, uh, this is an example of what Welles' version would be, but there is no real Welles' cut that we know of. No, no. Well, he, he finished the, uh, his first cut, but then he, he went off uh, before going in through the endless work of going to the final cut. The last three reels are uh, more closer to uh, what his work was than the uh, first three. They seem to mm. basically be concentrating on the, uh, the first three. Uh, the gaffer, by the way, um, Max uh, Nepal, um, according to Phil Bowles, had an important uh, part of this production. And if you look at the way everything is lit... It, oh, yeah, but depth, that's, that's partly Medi. Well, but it was the combination that yes. uh, a court, a Lathrop, Phil Lathrop, wonderful cinematographer, yes. and Russell Meddy. By the way, uh, right now there's another Harry. There's a Harry Keller shot that is removed, that would have been in the scene mm-hmm. right now. That uh, outside the hotel. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you, would, you guys were reconciling, and yeah. like nothing had happened to either one of you, mm-hmm. and it kind of broke up the uh, the suspense. And now it's gone. Well, yeah, it also this broke is... up the mounting displeasure she was feeling toward him. You know, as it as it as the tension grew, and he kept being away from her all the time. This is a very good sequence. The key to this whole thing is the dynamite. The killer didn't just want Lineker dead; he wanted him destroyed, annihilated. Over here, Vargas. This uh, version, by the way, in this sequence here with the acid, Mm -hmm. uh, in the short version, plays longer than in the long version for some reason. We have the full version here, but if you look at the uh, preview version, the Bob Epstein found version, the scene uh, loses its last line of dialogue. 
There's Azita Joy Lansing again. She wanted actually the part that you had, Janet, in the film because she was friends with Wells at that time. And Wells obviously wanted a stronger actress than uh, Joy Lansing, but she did wind up in the Fountain of Youth as the star of that film. Oh, really? That was that was her. Uh, thank you. Oh. Uh, some say that she was uh, Wells' girlfriend. Uh, and oh, I didn't. That's how I never she wound heard that. Picture. I'm more the last to know. <laughs> By the way, this music ends earlier, which is what he wanted. So it gives a chance for the musicians to come down the stairs and for us to meet another interesting cameo character. Oh, yes. Zsa -Zsa. Zsa -Zsa. And do you know how Zsa, Zsa wound up in this movie? No. Uh, when Albert Zugsmith, who was basically missing in action from what I was told, it, he was the true. producer of the film. Uh, so-called. Yeah, so-called <laughs> producer. Uh, what happened was he said, I hear you have Marlene Dietrich in the film. And Wells said, yeah, she's a friend of mine. He goes, well, I have a friend of mine, and I want her in the film, too. And well. his friend was Zsa, -Zsa. Oh, this was uh, Al... That, this was Zuck Smith's Smith. contribution. Zuck Smith, I see. This was his con... This is one of the best performances. That, that player piano is a marvelous element. And it really recurs. And there is... Very usefully. Well, it's immediately identifiable. Yeah. There's some things in the re-edit here that are kind of interesting. Uh, originally, the scene where you'll see uh, Ray Collins and um, Mort Mills making the comment out here played as one part. Now the comment is intercut after Orson comes in. Mm -hmm. Originally, you would have seen it, the whole before comment, before he went in. Here. This is better. Yeah. Oh, maybe she'll cook chili for him or uh, bring out the crystal ball. And now you cut and you're introduced to mm -hmm. Marlena. It was my earnest hope that somehow I might be in a scene with her in this movie, but it was not to be. Do you know <laughs> all her uh, scenes were shot in one day? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, everything, right to the end of the film, one mm -hmm. evening. Um, I got was, the production report here. We were all late. there. Um, yeah. I remember it was it was like a gala kind of event, which, in, of course, it was. Uh, but there was, like, champagne in every trailer and... Uh, uh, you know, a, a big celebration. It was just fun to be there. Even though you didn't have a scene with her, it was just fun to be there. Yeah, they started uh, about... The shooting call was at 6.30 in the evening and ran right through till uh, 5.28 when she uh, exits the uh, film and closes the entire yeah, film. That's the end of the film, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it shows that uh, Ch Ch Chuck, you were here, and uh, Janet was there, and oh. Joe Clear was there. Well, Janet uh, came up in the car. That's part of the end of the film, of course. And then I'm yeah. obviously in the scene, too. Right. But uh, but we were there early, um, and uh, uh, it was just fun to hang out on the set. <laughs> and I think um, they did uh, all that stuff in the canal and chasing through the oil derricks. We did that, that stuff at... Uh, in the canals in sequence, didn't we? Yes, you did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the only reshoot was at the end where um, you and Janet reconciled. That was a uh, Harry Keller reshoot. Mm -hmm. By the way, you notice there's no music right now. There used to be music throughout this entire mm -hmm. part, and Orson wanted the music to be taken out for the pianola to end so that you would feel the serious uh, emotions between the two characters. Yeah. Um, and it did pay yeah, off. because that's the longest yeah. scene he has with her. Well, I the think. audiences start laughing when they see her, and they used to laugh throughout the entire piece. Now the audience stop. The music, the second the music, music ends, stops. they stop. That's uh, Phil Harvey, uh, by the way, who plays Blaine, the other uh, fourth member of the posse. Do you remember Phil Harvey at all? Or? I remember him in the scene. I didn't know him as, you know, other than there. What makes you so sure of that, Captain? This looks like one of the most difficult scenes to shoot. The sound, you have the wind blowing here, and then you cut back and there's no wind. Now watch, you'll cut back to... It could have been another night. Just, we did several nights. You'll cut back to Orson, there's the wind. <laughs> the sound... Uh, had to go crazy on Had that. to go crazy on this film. And uh, we'll cut back again, and there's no wind. <laughs> A little yeah. movie magic there. Yes, indeed. Wind machine. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, the whole thing is to keep the uh, effects smooth between, so you hear a little of the wind in the background. Um, and this is, by the way, the very first time that you'll hear a musical underscore come into the picture. Before that, everything else in the film has been source music from uh, the cabarets and around town mm -hmm. through the uh, pianola and through um, the mu musicians in the cabaret. But right here, you'll hear the first underscoring. And his original plan was to have basically two forms of underscoring throughout the film and nothing else. And no other music. No other, mu yeah. no other music but source music. Yeah, sort of, yeah. And that was because yeah. his experience came from radio. You know, That's and true. everyone yeah. wonders why in Citizen Kane it was so revolutionary as far as sound, and it was because he had just come out of radio, so he knew how to tell the story in more than one medium. Mm -hmm. That's and, an interesting point. I think you're quite right. And um, yeah, it, 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 yeah it, he just really made it um, come alive with his soundtrack, and that's why he, in his memo, he, w he was so clear about his music changes as well. Walter Murch, um, who edited this project uh, with me, uh, who had been involved in films like The Godfather and Apocalypse Now yeah, and Julian Ghost and English yeah. Patient, said he had never read anything quite like that as far as a director who paid so much attention to music and to uh, the way the film should be scored. Well, it's so obvious, too, Rick, because uh, uh, taking the music out of the opening shot, away from the opening shot, you know, in the, the way it had been was so effective uh, and gave you the full impact of the opening shot. And the same with the scene with Marlena and, and Orson um, not having music under, under it. That's a very good cut with the shadow of Orson uh, behind me on the wall. It's great. And this is, this is such a haunt, you know, haunting yeah. feeling in the evening. Uh, when you see the close-up of the flashlight shot uh, with mm -hmm. uh, Janet with you right there, mm. yeah. that's Harry Keller. That, that, was a re really? that was one of the reshoots that oh, you really? did with Harry Keller. Yeah. Oh, no, that's it right there. I'm sorry. I, uh, you mean the close angle? That close-up is a Harry Keller yeah. reshoot. What do you remember about this? Was most of this done at the studio or was it on location? Um... I don't, I don't. Well, I drive by was, on the lot, so almost certainly. That was on, that was on location. You can turn it off that now. there? I think so. Well, maybe I remembered it at the... Looking out the at window. At least the part when I drive past, and she can't reach me. I love this scene. There isn't any shade on the window. Now, this interior was certainly at the studio. Yeah. There, was, there was a line of dialogue that he had asked to be changed that was honored by the studio because you had mentioned to Susie to lock the door, mm -hmm. and she said that she would, and, she and obviously you walk in the door and it's not <laughs> yeah. locked. So Wells asked to please take that line out, and that line never appeared in the film. Well, they listened to one thing. <laughs> they listened to about 20%. Um, I mean... When you have someone on the level of Orson Welles on your lot and you're making films like Tammy, you know, and The Doctor and Bonzo, you're not exactly sure what you have. Um, no. He wasn't the easiest person for the executives to get along with. No. This is obviously a backdrop here. This is done on a stage. Or it might have been in the back lot. Yeah, don't you think that was the universe? They had all kinds of buildings. They like had that. a all lot. Look at that sky, though. Yeah. That, that's yeah, but that's that's would be on on the on the back lot. They had sky uh, skies Backings. there too. Did they at uh -huh. the time? Oh yeah. Because yeah, since the I, I only know the uh, lot since you know it's been rebuilt after a fire. No, no, but they had all ago. sorts of uh, different locales. Red streets, on European streets. Uh, Western, yeah, every, Western, you know, streets, almost anything. Small town streets. This was also taken out on the stairs, and he yeah. asked to have this reinstated, and the studio did it. Uh -huh. um, this, yeah, this was certainly one of the things we did for Harry, when Harry. This is a Harry Keller shot. No, right? actually, no. no this is this, this is Wells, but there is a Harry Keller shot outside, and I'll, I'll oh. show you. Watch, you'll you'll see how the backgrounds change. Yeah. Uh, when uh, Janet goes outside, you'll see one mm -hmm. shot. You look at the couches, and it's one kind of couch. And then you see another kind of couch. 
Um, well, if they're trying to sort one couch out from another, we're doing a lousy job then. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but it does uh, show you the difference between yeah. the two. He is very good. Good performance. Okay, now here you see your... Oh, yeah. The couches are... I mean, after watching this film 50 or 60 times, yeah. you start seeing things that nobody's ever going to see. But now you uh, commentary fans will <laughs> be able to be part of my nightmare. Uh, oh, my pleasure. Now, this is Wells. And Janet, you're going to come out. Okay, here you go. Now there's this Wells. Now look at look 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 at the couch and that lamp there and the, mm -hmm. to your left. Mm -hmm. Now as you watch, you now you're looking at the postcard. Insert, yeah. And there's an insert, and that was um, this is part part. Of, that was the only. Okay, here now look at the couch. No lamp, nothing mm -hmm. in the background. This is Harry. <laughs> It's been the whole background has changed. Oh yeah. But Wells didn't object to this because no, he wanted. No, it doesn't make any difference. Really. Well, no, he didn't object to it because he wanted this dialogue in there. Uh, he asked that this dialogue about uh, her sticking by her husband to stay in, and um, this was dialogue that was requested, so it didn't interfere with what he wanted in the memo. That's why he didn't complain. But it was a Harry Keller shot. Mm -hmm. The furniture is different, and now we're back to Wells. These cars are beautiful. Yes. I heard there was some kind of endorsement made. I didn't hear about it. And that was the... Endorsement. Did they give you a car, Janet? I beg pardon? Did they give you a car? No. They probably gave it to Zug Smith. <laughs> ah, that Th might There you be. go. Yeah. I never saw any car. I didn't get any car. No, they probably gave it to Zug Smith. Oh, my. If I go to the American Hotel, it's just for... You know, Zug Smith was interesting, too. He... Did the Incredible Shrinking Man and Written in the Wind, or Written on the Wind, I'm sorry, and then did films like The Private Lives of Adam and Eve and um, mm. LSD, I Hate You. <laughs> <laughs> at the time of this film, he was trying to get a film off the ground at Universal called Stalin is Alive. Who? I'm sorry? Stalin, Stalin is Alive was the film he was trying to get made while he was working on Touch of Evil. I found it in the uh, notes at USC. Okay, here's a radio insert that was put into the uh, new version of the film. He wanted the radio patterns to be very clear. Well, it started with when Chuck pushed the thing in, in our car. Yeah, but now uh, Grandy has a radio, too. He didn't right. have one before. No, but I mean, it, that's how it started, and right. then now it, it, this keeps it up. I wish I could figure out where we shot this. I this don't was think a this process. was back lot. This was Harry oh, Keller process. process? Oh. And it was, from what I can see, a reshoot of what you had shot previously because the dialogue doesn't change that much from Wells' version. Uh, there is a little extra line of dialogue at the end, but nothing drastic. And I have a feeling that maybe these were shots that... Uh, that Wells had shot... Pro it indicated in the production reports that he had also shot process shots for this, well, that's which everyone says Wells would never have shot a process shot, but the production report differs with that, and uh, Wells was stated as director, and it was during production. You've really done your homework on this, haven't you? Well, <laughs> it's it, very impressive. It's an important work to study, and it's important to study all three versions, and not just one. This is an example, but there is a release version and a preview version. This has changed a little from what was original. The, the shots of Grandy would come after you met um, up with Quinlan, but this was something else. Wells wanted you to be uh, interrupted on a kiss, not on Janet going to sleep. So your line about going to sleep has been removed, and it's more of a lovemaking thing. This is I like that better. Yeah, this is no, I don't <laughs> often get the girl, you know. This, this, I'm delighted with this. And also, if you notice, uh, this is a Keller shot because Wells is not in that car. That's a double for Wells in the back oh, there. Yeah. But Wells didn't object to this shot because in his version, he forgot to uh, give Calera the cane, and the cane becomes an important prop throughout no. the entire film. He'd, he'd forgotten that. No. And the so. story. So he did not object to this. 
No, I Joe just is not. so good in the whole film. Wherever you see him, he never misses. Do you know he was the kissing bandit in My Little Chickadee? Was he? <laughs> and he was born in Malta. And he, no, no. Wells had seen him, from what I heard, on stage or uh, early in the 30s and just loved him as an actor and yeah, always wanted to use him. Very good actor. That's the only time I ever worked with him. But. I asked him, uh, Rick, Chuck, if, yeah. uh, if Joe always looked did, uh, like he uh, needed a shave or was it just for this picture? <laughs> And I don't Rick know. said that, that it was other pictures well, as well. Well, in Gilder, he uh, needed a shave, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are his other credits? So, this must be out north somewhere. I don't think that's back. This north. is uh, in uh, Palmdale area. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that's. The, the uh, aqueduct was in the background there. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Where. And now you can see. And the motel was. That's a real where the motel, motel was. Yeah. It was a real motel um, out there. I wonder where uh, Hitchcock got the idea of putting you in a desolate motel. What do you remember about Dennis Weaver? I remember the f- when we, uh, you know, uh, the, his part had maybe oh, half a page, like describing the the motel keeper coming and that uh, he didn't want to make the bed and, and it was a little odd and that was it. I mean, there was no big deal. And then when Dennis showed up and we rehearsed it, I almost, it was wonderful because wonderful. it was such a different take on, on this from character. from Orson to direct the film or getting the studio to let him, I also suggested the casting of Dennis because a good friend of mine was Milburn Stone who was with Dennis in Gunsmoke. And so I'd seen a lot of his work. And he's very good. Perfect in the part. Perfect. And, and it, Dennis, interesting it, hmm? that, that uh, Dennis said that he didn't really have a take on the character until he was called for like 9 o'clock and naturally didn't get to, uh, this, you know, to him until maybe 4 or 5 in the afternoon. And that's when he had come up with this characterization and had gone to Orson and, you know, said, what do you think of this? And Orson said, yes, fly with it. And, uh, <laughs> and the that. first time, I tell you, I just... It was, it was wonderful. You can imagine what it lent to the scene. The, um, you, you told me that Dennis uh, did not want to do the part. He, I don't. He didn't have his feet in the ground, his heels in the ground, or anything like that about it. But he, he just didn't see. I said, "You have to do this part. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity to work with a great director." And he said, "Yeah, I guess you're right." Well, he told me uh, Janet and I had dinner with him in oh, Telluride. Oh, yeah, what did he say about it? And he said that uh, he's grateful uh, mm-hmm. about being convinced to do this, and he said that between Touch of Evil and Duel, he hasn't mm-hmm. been in a lot of movies, but he's been with two of the greatest directors in what he considered two great movies. Uh, his background was more television. He did mm-hmm. say that his character <laughs> was supposed to be obsessed with sex but scared of it, and that he was kind of a... Shakespearean gesture, jester. Jester, uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, basically he was supposed to be totally obsessed with sex, but totally petrified by the same, you know, notion of it. Well, that's sort of what comes through, isn't it? Oh, sure, everything connected. Uh, but that was so wonderful to play against. I mean, it just adds to to Susan's complete <laughs> despair at, at this time <laughs> to be faced with this, you know... <laughs> Weirdy. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. And here we are at the uh, Lineker uh, bomb site. And this is part of Wells' tour de force of sound between radio and explosions and sirens that's coming up here. Complaint about stolen dynamite out here. You find anybody lately? 
You mean that using the, uh, the the source sound? Using the source sounds, yes. He wanted, you know, explosions, radio, sirens. You know, he want again not wanting that too much of an underscore, you know, for the film. Uh, Eddie Farnham, uh, that's Gus Schilling, uh, mm-hmm. character actor, uh, seen in a lot of films in the fifties uh, as Eddie Farnham. Parole. Who got you this job? My lawyer, Howard Franks. Randy's lawyer. Come in, car ten. Suspect now in custody at five four. Well, this is it. Suspect? Mm. Is that the one you've been talking about, the Sanchez? As far as I can make out, they've located him, right, Captain? Yeah, Marshall. Oh, you know the dark glasses? I just thought, Chuck, yeah. uh, the, those dark glasses that you wore in the movie, yeah. I donated to Planet Hollywood. Did you? Well, yes. good. Yes, in Toronto. Boy, the Toronto Film Festival, they... We had, what, about a five, ten minute standing ovation? Oh, yeah. They just went totally berserk there. That's wonderful. Okay, we, we are now going to come to uh, what yes, um, this is a cinematographer John scene. Bailey has told me is one of his favorite shots of all time, which he feels is more impressive than, uh, than the, opening. the opening shot, which is the Sanchez apartment uh, shot, which was the first day of shooting. It took more work, first day of shooting, yeah. And I think it's, as I recall, it was about a 13-page scene. Maybe not, maybe it's not quite that long. Well, I'll tell you what. If you want to discuss it for a few minutes, I'll find the scene and we'll, I'll time it out for you. I have a, a copy of Orson's shooting script right here. And we'll nail that right down to the record. Yeah, I'd be interested to know that. Because I wasn't there. I wasn't in the shooting, but I, I sure heard about it. Yeah, it was... What do you remember about this first day, Chuck? I remember uh, that we had rehearsed it with Orson before there. That's, and it was a, a cinematic tour de force. To It took him half the day before we turned the camera. And as you know, um, the production department of any studio on the first day of shooting on a film uh, requires one of the ADs to phone in the first time they turn a camera and also the first time they make a print. And it got to be after lunch uh, before we even started shooting because a very complicated shot. The, the geography of going in and out of the bathroom and the bedroom and down, people come in from outside with donuts and so on. And... Uh, then it, we did actually about, I can't remember really, but about five or six takes, certainly. And then he said, uh, okay, that's a print, that's a wrap in this sequence. We are two days ahead of schedule. Well, that was... Um, Is that... Uh, th- that's what I see. I see, by the way, it was seven pages. Seven pages. Seven yeah. pages, that's and right. what it looked like was you had done some pickup shots earlier that day, but at, l- after lunch... Nothing happened between 1.24 and 5.45. You yeah. broke for lunch at 12.24. At 1.24, you finished lunch. Between 1.24 and 5.45, Orson rehearsed the film with the cast. Uh, you did some makeup between 5.45 and 6.25, and this, uh, this shot here, seen here was uh, started at 6.25 and ended at 7.40 that evening, and that was uh, around. How many takes? Well, and it looked, I, I can't tell how many takes, but... No. Um, it certainly wasn't a one-take setup. No. No. I had remembered it as more takes, perhaps because it was so complicated. But, but basically, uh, it was done, you know, I mean, it was, it was accomplished in a little more than an hour and 15 minutes, yeah. seven pages. Yeah. Well, that's spectacular. It's, uh, also, if you look at Orson's makeup in this shot, since this was the first official day... He doesn't look nearly as fat as no, he does in, no. when he makes his entrance in the beginning into the rest he of the film. He may have decided that he wanted to do uh, a heavier, uh, you know, fatter man. He looks a lot. Uh, he looks a lot. Uh, he looks younger. Younger, yeah. Younger, yeah. He doesn't have the stuff under the, the eyes under as much, eyes. or not as many much uh, in the jowls. Yeah, it's a wonderfully oh, no, written. There's scene Casey, too. by the way. That's what. Rest, that's his double. Something here, Captain. Some love letters. That's Rusty Westcoat, who doubled for Wells throughout the entire film. He's the only person that was on the set every single day. Uh-huh. In English. 
do you want to know? Everything, boy, the works. Now, let's start with the shoes. Want shoe me to store. call the motel, by yeah, guess? Yeah, Charlie, I'm to meet Lennox's daughter yeah. in, the, in the shoe store. Selling her shoes. <laughs> See, this overlapping dialogue is typical of Wells. He liked that. Look at that. Okay, that punch that you hear there was in the preview version, but it was not in the original uh, release version of the film. That was something that they had taken out. Mm -hmm. But it's good. It's very but, oh, it's a very effective. Yeah. He wanted it there. He. Yeah. Well, it just shows, you know, how he got his confessions. Exactly. Uh, we See, have... the lighting is so interesting, that low light. When we finished the cut, we forgot to put the punch in because we were working with an original <laughs> negative on the uh, short version of the film, and it didn't have it. And I got a phone call from Jonathan Rosenbaum, our consultant in uh, Chicago, who was the one who originally had... Uh, published the memo in Film Quarterly in 1992, and he said, it looks great, but, but you forgot the punch. And it was like he was greatly <laughs> upset about this. So, Jonathan, the punch is back in, as you can see. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, yes, it's very effective. Yes, uh, and we really do owe uh, a lot of gratitude for Jonathan because he... How did he get, in, how did he get a hold of the memo? He was the editor of the book. This is Orson Welles that was put together by Peter Bogdanovich and Orson yeah. from the interviews. Mm -hmm. so and the memo was originally supposed to be published in that book, a condensed version of the memo. And HarperCollins decided that it was too much. And so they um, decided to take the memo out. And Jonathan um, convinced um, that it should be, uh, Film Quarterly should publish it and Trafic, a publication in France, published it. And... Um, that's how this whole thing started. Uh, I wanted to do a laser disc. I've got to point out what a wonderful moment this is with the, him talking on the phone and the blind woman watching or listening. Exactly. It's I'd like the telephone number of the Miradorm. And they, that, was, that uh, wasn't in the uh, released version. Yes, it was. Yeah, no, think. not with the blind woman. It was, uh, the phone call was, but not... They... they uh, eclipse the blind woman. Well, well, they didn't put her in as prominent in the shot. Yeah. But anyway, so Jonathan wound up, you know, being playing a great uh, part in this uh, in this project. Well, I remember in Telluride when Peter uh, Bogdanovich said uh, to me that a year before Orson had died that he had a, spent an evening or a day with him, and uh, and then Orson said, they're going to love me when I'm dead. It was so poignant. Well, he's really of a Mozartian level, you know. He, yes, you know, it's very similar. That's a good, a good analogy. And, you know, I, for the 50s, you know, we had Elvis and, you know, yeah. different musicians. And then we had Mingus Monk and Coltrane. And Elvis, and he was a little more of a Mingus Monk and Coltrane. He was... They're not, they don't date themselves as much, even though they're music from that era. Yeah. Yes. You know. There, there's the shot. The news is bad. Quinlan is about to arrest that boy Sanchez. And... Oh, Mike, is that why you called? To tell me somebody's been arrested? No, that's not really why I called. It... It's to tell you how sorry I am about all this. How oh, very, very much I love you. Susie? This may be one of your sexiest shots, Janet. <laughs> yes, it is. It was a great deal, pay, you know. Well, see, that's the kind of love scene I get. I'm five miles away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like the car scene better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so did I. Of course you are. Well, then, I'll be calling You're pretty abrupt here. Goodbye. Yeah, well, well, that's... Uh, back to business. Busy, busy. I do have a lot of things in underwear, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello. Yes. Oh, I just. How many ta takes did he uh, do for a single shot? Was he? Did he? Co compared to Hitchcock, Hitchcock uh, didn't do. Did he do a lot of takes? Uh, not unless it was necessary. And the same with Wells. I mean, um, he, he wasn't. 
He did what was necessary. I mean, if something went wrong, you'd do it again. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it, if everything was right, and it was the first take, if it was right, he'd do it. Uh, there are some directors, like uh, George Stevens, would, would just do maybe 50 takes um, and not know exactly which one, you know, because he would be getting different nuances and different things um, at different times. But uh, Orson and Hitchcock, they would only do what they needed. Mm. Frankenheimer must have been the same, too. And Frankenheimer was the same way. Yeah. But if they needed more, they'd do it. And Frank Sinatra in Manchurian um, was evidently notorious that he would only do one take or two takes or something. And he would he did as many as was necessary with uh, Frankenheimer um, uh, if it was needed. You mean you don't care about the money? Why should I lie? What was the reception on this film uh, originally when it came out? Was it anticlimactic for you? Well, um, the reception was very lukewarm, actually. I mean, you know, as it was released as a bottom half of a double bill, and it didn't get any promotion or any um, help from the studio. And um, it didn't... It, a few art um, people were favorably impressed, but... Actually, it went over the heads of, of most of them, um, and I think a lot of it was because of, of the way it had been uh, released. Um, of course, this time around, with the with your re-edit uh, version, that it's been an, a unanimous kind of, of overwhelming acceptance and, and um, wonderfully received. This was uh, originally published in, the, taken from a book that was published in 1956 called Badge of Evil. Um, and it was written at, by a guy that was known as Whit Masterson, but he re really was two authors named Robert A. Wade and H. Billy Miller. Here's the best close-up we, or uh, close confrontation we have in the film. And I talked to Robert Wade, the author, just recently on the phone. He's oh. living in San Diego. Alive and well in Alive San Diego. and well. And he said to me, this was not a pulp book. This was a popular book. It had two printings in hardcover. And that the New York Herald Tribune called it a savage melodrama, wild, exciting, and persuasive. Hmm. <laughs> and um, said it sold very well. I'll be darned. I didn't know that either. I knew it was from a novel, Badge of Evil, but I didn't know that it had... Yeah, um... Just how much dynamite was it? These two writers uh, sold the book in 56 to Universal, and it became a uh, screenplay uh, by a fellow named Phil Monish. I didn't Paul even Monish. know there was a... Paul Monish. But Paul Monish. I didn't even know there was a book of it. I thought it was just an original screenplay. Yeah. A Paul Monish. And that's the script that you originally saw. Yeah, which was not as good as this. No. No. Well, Hankins has done it again. He's nailed his man. Thanks to you, partner. Me? Yeah. Uh, if that dynamite had been a snake there in the bathroom, it would have bit me. Well, I was Chief Gould, and I'd keep you informed, Vargas, so I'm doing it. This is it. We've broken the case. Rudy Lineker was uh, blown up with eight sticks of dynamite, and uh, Sanchez stole ten. That leaves two, and we found them both. You heard that, boy. We found the dynamite. That's impossible. Well, we found two sticks. Like That's Fox. The right what, did, what did Orson Welles uh, do to contribute to your uh, acting style within this film? I don't think he did much in terms of the style of acting. Acting style is a uh, curious phrase. I'm not entirely certain what it means, but I've, um, he taught me many things. Just, uh, well, for, for, as an offhand example, he said to me, I can't remember when we were shooting. Wait, I just want to see this last moment. He swears on his mother's grave that there has never been any dynamite in this apartment. Sure. Chuck, I like the mustache. Yeah. It, it, it works for the part. Mm hmm. Very much. Well, did you know when you. You were supposed to be uh, an Hispanic when you agreed to do the film? I can't remember in uh, whether he was Spanish. Uh, Mexican. He wasn't in the he wasn't no. in the book, and no. he wasn't in the monastery. That was Orson. Orson did that. Right, that's what and I'm saying. He was signed on idea. to play this character before he the was a Spanish. But yeah, 
But um, it makes it a much more interesting character. Right. Wasn't and it just the opposite that that the girl was the girl Hispanic? was Hispanic. The girl yeah. was Hispanic. Girl was Mexican, and uh, and what Orson felt was that if she was Hispanic, it was all right for an Anglo to marry an Hispanic woman. That in the fifties wouldn't shake things up. But if a Hispanic man married a blonde, beautiful debutante, educated, yeah. no matter who he was. Yeah, that that uh, was going they, to they, they, ruffle that feathers was his a little concept. more. Right. Well, that's one of the, again. Uh, you know, he he broached subjects and uh, ch- challenged subjects that were verboten. You know. Here is the. Your, no, your performance here is definitely. Uh, you know, I mean. So is Arson's. It, it's a. It's a wonderful. It's scene. a nightmarish ev- chain of events. Yeah. It's a clash of you know oh. two theatrical actors on the, on the uh, in film. He probably even planned the shadow of his cane on my face in that just before. Oh, I, I bet out. he did. Uh, I bet you're right. Hank, what are we going to do with this granny guy? Take no. him in. Now this is um, the way this next shot is choreographed, and the when you get in the car with uh, Schwartz Mort Mills. Mm-hmm. That, that's another, another famous oh, first that's world, incredibly, first world yeah. To the best of my knowledge, it was the first scene shot in an actual moving car, not a, with back screen projection or projection. This was shot on location in Venice on Speedway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I heard that there was the camera was mounted on the uh, hood a of the flat, car. They took the windshield out. They put a platform on over the the front of the car. And all the uh, all the sound equipment in the back, so there was no room for anybody else. Except that you couldn't put the operator on. And Russ said, "Look, let's let's hook it to a, a truck and tow it." And Orson said, "No, no, these lads can take care of that." And so I, I directed the scene. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, but uh, there was a sound man in the trunk. I was told. Uh, this was what Phil Bowles, the AD, told me. He said that there was a sound man in the trunk, but what happened was he was locked in there before the car started, and that he was Maybe. to set the Nagra because in the place did, as you were taking off. They did uh, teach us how to turn on the, you know, when how to know when you got yeah. the speed and so on, because that I remember distinctly. They said, yeah. you know, and it was kind of fun. I said, okay, action. <laughs> and then it, uh, Mort said, speed. And I said, oh, no, then I said action, uh, turnover. Then I said action. And uh, then we went down to the end, and, and Orson was waiting there with everyone. And he said, well, how was it? I said, wonderful. I'd like another take, please. <laughs> well, that must, you know, that, that could have been his way of, again, making the sound man's life miserable. Mm-hmm. Lock him in the might, trunk going 80 miles an hour down Speedway. <laughs> yes. A real but nice I wasn't guy. Aware that there was <laughs> Talk about a, a, <laughs> a feud. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And here, here we are back now. You see, and if you notice, the way he intercut in the beginning and what he wanted to intercut in the beginning is now being executed beautifully in the, these last three reels, which yeah. is Wells, more of Wells' cutting pattern, where it is telling two stories back and forth. And here we go with and that great shot. Them, yeah. Yeah. It's just... Yeah. And yeah, you can see the windshield is gone if you yeah, certainly. look at it and... The breeze is blowing, and you're going down Speedway, which doesn't look really that much different today. Uh, there's some condos in there, and the rent is going up a little, I think. Um, I think it looks a lot different from that hotel where I was on the balcony, though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, that was really crummy. Uh, it still has some dangerous areas down there. It's a, it's a mixture of both. It's kind of like... Um, What's happened in New York, where you have one street where you have very affluent houses, and another street where you know it's very scary. In a block. I was at Dennis Hopper's house one day yes. in the beautiful oh. home in Venice, um. <laughs> and you're looking at, out the window, and people are literally getting into fights. Yeah. I wondered if you could turn that music off. This is a wonderful scene. Would it be possible to ask those people next door to move, just to another cabin? You see, I'm still trying to get some sleep. Where would you like me to take you, doll? You 
got the stuff? Hey. I brought that some of the other guys. Look at Dennis. I just, he's just too much. But I just, again, with the intercutting, it just makes the suspense, you know, build. It's it's incredible. I see it every time now I see the picture. But I broke my arm um, the week before we started rehearsals. And so um, I did the picture with my arm set at, at uh, like a 45 degree angle. Uh, and in the shots in the, in the, uh, uh, in the Teddy, and uh, where I, we couldn't cover it, uh, we sawed it in half, and I'd take it, the cast off, and then um, they, after the take, they'd put it back on with tape. Um, and we camouflaged it pretty well, I think. I, I don't think a lot of people never, ever knew I had a broken arm. Most people don't. Uh, yeah. it, it surprises them, uh, even... Um well, but you, you know, with, it, you put the sweater, and I had a a, a, a bag that, um, having it set that way, it it just sort of melded in, and it was um, easy to camouflage. Um, the only trouble, as I said, was when when uh, uh, when it was without, where we didn't have clothes to cover it, and so then we had to, uh, um, you know, take the the cast off. But we worked it out. Okay. This, this is a, always a great scene when you call and you're basically trying to call the police station. Um, it, it, uh, he says that's the police, yeah. Yeah, it, I, I love it. The, but there was also in that shot, uh, if you look at it in the 133 uh, ratio, which was, it was shot full frame but composed for 185. Um, for those who are uh, film you're, geeks you're, out there that will understand that. And I don't that, understand that. That's so. why we're watching it in a widescreen format. But you could actually see a boom shot uh, in the 133 that now is gone. Um, and see, it does look great in the widescreen format. It is the way Mehdi had composed it. And each shot really is when you see these two and three shots, they're composed beautifully um, in the 185 ratio. Again, I just keep saying it, but it's so important, the, the value of keeping both stories alive. It, it, just, it, it just makes it a different picture. And this is the first time that you really start seeing the relationship between the two stories, between why Grandy is uh, antagonizing Vargas and Susan and what Wells is trying to accomplish by being uh, trying to defend his right to defend you know, to investigate this case the way he's going to investigate it, Which not, we, not with Vargas's uh, help. Right, because so, we already know what he's done. So this is a major uh, turning point in the film. And uh, again, the source music is back again the way he originally intended it. And again, it just shows how right he was. Yeah, no, he... Um, this is just... This film holds up beautifully over the years. It really does. Can we think to that? I don't. You know, it's amazing that this film is in mono. Leonard Maltin just wrote that he thought it was the best sound so far for 1998 of any film. <laughs> and we're dealing with a film that was 40 years old and a mono mix. That's Isn't right. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. He also said it was probably the best camera work of any film for 1998. So he, uh, it was a nice praise from Leonard. Yes, it is. And uh, he is a man who does know his movies. That's a very valuable opinion. And boy, Janet, you look very annoyed here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was. <laughs> we're going to um, be meeting um, Mercedes McCambridge pretty soon. Oh, that to me is the, the most sinister and... Mm -hmm. Frightening, weird, icky. <laughs> yeah, she she is uh, she's fantastic. Oh, here is the famous mm -hmm. elevator shot. Now, when we were rehearsing this, well, not this, but when I a uh, run up, it was yeah, handheld. I do. No, because he was waiting with a camera up above, but he said to me, Chuck, do you think you could get up to the second floor uh, in the same, as fast as the elevator? And it was a pretty slow elevator, so I said, yeah, I think I can do that, Arson. <laughs> do you remember who shot this in the elevator? 
Oh, th- this part. I don't know, because obviously I wasn't in the shot. I thought it was Phil Lathrop. Uh, May Phil well Bolst have been. told me he, he thought Orson actually shot this with a handheld arrow. Might have. Might well have. The, there you see. That this was, was Orson's... And uh, I'm not even breathing hard. How about that? Well done, Chuck. I couldn't do that now. <laughs> no. <laughs> At least not without breathing hard. And the, now you're in this shot here. The, this is where we had a little problem as far as timing goes, as far as setting the registration between the two prints of the film. Uh, it was a little dark, and uh, the people at YCM Labs, uh, Richard Dayton and Eric Agila, did a really fine job with the copy that you now see of Touch of Evil. And the print looks absolutely beautiful. got some more beautiful. light in it. Oh, they did a spectacular job over at YCM. Um, and um, real pros. The um, scene here, this was then probably done at the studio. I think, well, it, I think it probably was, yeah. Yeah. My name is Vargas. I'd like to speak with my wife. Once we had started on the night schedule, um, when we had finished uh, in Venice, we continued on the night schedule because uh, uh, otherwise you almost like lose a day because of the turnaround. And uh, so some of the interiors were shot at the studio, but at night. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's the famous line where that was taken out from the release version where they talk about you taking it in the vein. Uh, definitely scary text for that time. Oh, yes, yes. absolutely. And that line was... Not in the release version, but in the preview version, it, it was uh, in. Mercedes Cambridge, which you'll see on the other side there, uh, did you know she was the voice uh, for Linda Blair in The Exorcist when she was the devil? No, I Oh, didn't I did know not that. know that. Yeah, she had a very deep voice for a woman. And she won Best Supporting Actress for All the King's Men. I knew that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, she mm-hmm. had worked with Wells in radio quite a bit. and I, she, that's I knew she'd she worked from. with him, yeah. And well, isn't that why all these uh, the people who came back for cameos, like Joe Cotton and all the people, had worked with them and Ray had Ray Collins uh, too. And there Joe she Collin. is, terrifying. Look at that. She was great in Giant. Mm-hmm. If you remember her from Giant, she's really a good I mean, actress. She's just extraordinary actress and very little screen presence, but it sticks with you. <laughs> well, this sure st- st- stuck with me. I'll tell you. <laughs> It sticks with the audience. Um, Wells' nose, that was not his nose. He carried around, from what I understood, uh, different noses for each production, and he would. He had a makeup artist that basically. Did noses. Yeah, if you look at well, Wells and his, most of his publicity shots without it, he had a very small nose, and he realized that early on. And instead of, he, it's the same makeup artist who uh, was with him with Citizen Kane. remember his nose in Chimes at Midnight. There is a nose. Th- that is a nose. <laughs> yeah. And I heard there's a restoration going on in Chimes at Midnight That's a right wonderful, now. Uh, that is a great film. I think it's, it's his one strongest of, best, of his Shakespearean yes. works. Oh, far and away. Much better than Othello or Macbeth. And I it's think. his favorite film of, of his career. I don't wonder. I don't wonder. Yeah. When asked uh, what he would like to be most remembered for, or what film he would take to heaven, Chimes at Midnight. Midnight. Yeah. And his favorite director was Jean Renoir. Hmm. He, when he asked if he could save any film, what film would he save? And he said anything by Jean Renoir. The man had a lot of taste. Yes, he did. Definitely. Uh, but your Shakespearean background started with Julius Caesar uh, during I college? See. Yes. No, after, after college, after the war, it was done by uh, people that I'd worked with in, at, at Northwestern. Uh, then I did, uh, I did another. I, the, my, my Broadway debut was in Antony and Cleopatra with Miss Cornell. We had eight months in that. That was a, the longest the play has ever run anywhere. That was obviously not due to me, but Miss Cornell was wonderful in it. Now, your Shakespearean uh, background uh, is a background that a lot of people are not familiar with. You know, they'll remember you for, you know, Ben-Hur and... That's true. I'm very proud of the fact that I've done more Shakespearean films than any American actor. Of course, the Brits do them all the time, but... 
Also, I heard I read in a book recently that uh, one of the films that was had the strongest impact on you and your wife uh, Lydia was um, Citizen Kane. Yeah, sure. That was. A right, film. I think it had a big impact on anyone who saw it, especially anyone that was in the profession. Janet and uh, Chuck, both. Do you, what? What do you remember when you first saw Kane? Do you do you remember? I was stunned by it. Likewise, that's yeah. that's that's very aptly put. Yeah, just stunning film. You know the story. I I was not present, but Bogdanovich confirmed it to me when Arson was getting his free lunches at uh, not the bistro. Uh, Mamezon. Mamezon. And uh, I, he was polite to people who came up always. And a young man came up quivering with excitement. And he said, Mr. Wells, I must <laughs> tell you that you are a great director. And the, I, the, the, the Citizen Kane is, is the greatest film I, I ever made. And I, I did just have the whoop. And Morrison said, thank you, thank you. He said, I just have one question. It's just that, that when Ken is dying and he drops the, the, the glass ball with the s snow in it, and, 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 and he, uh, then he's dead. But th th there's no one in the room, so how do they know what his last words are? And Arson pulled him close and he said, You must never repeat a word of what you've just told me to a living soul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, he was a. Well, I, he was wonderful, wonderful to work with. I know I've heard Janet speak on that, too. Now, here's going to be, in the memo, Wells discussed one shot that Harry Keller directed that he really liked and basically said, wanted to compliment the author and the director on this shot. Was and, it this shot? And it's the shot, it's the shot of you and Mort Mills that this is going to cut to on the top of the stairwell. And he just said... It, this needed that shot, and whoever did it, bravo to him. You know, it's what, like, a, what a gracious thing for him to say. And you got to remember that Harry Keller's been known as someone who directed um, the rather young show, but he also did direct, you know, some interesting films as well. Um, he wasn't, you know, the A director of it, but no. he was a. You well, know, he was certainly a competent uh, director. Wasn't he? Oh, he was known. Was he known more for his writing? Wasn't it? I mean, I, I I always think of him as a writer more than than. Uh, here we are. This is the shot. This is the shot right here. But this is what Wells considered a great piece of direction that was added into the film that he had not done. I'll show you. I'd like to get back to my wife. No. Um, Very good. He had also done a film called The Female uh, Animal the, the same year that Touch of Evil was made. And he had done uh, Tammy Tell Me True and Tammy and the Doctor. Um, what do you mean, eh? But basically, and uh, a film called Skin Game that was done in 71, that was kind of a minor hit, I think, with James Garner. Uh, but mm -hmm. he, he, he just never made it as a major director, but he was a competent guy Certainly on the lot. Certainly was a competent director, didn't you think so, Janet? Oh, yes, yes. No. I, I, my quarrel was not with him. Oh, no, he was, no. Uh, uh, my quarrel, or our quarrel, or our feelings were just uh, uh, at the studio for this treason, I felt. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was... I it, can't remember when we did those retakes. It was in one day, wasn't it? One you, day you or did half them day. At, it was in mid-November, mm -hmm. and uh, it was basically done in one day, and it was a setup that went from... I think uh, a short day, too. Cause. Well, well, the thing is, he shot uh, Valentin de Vargas and Tamaroff, and he did a bunch of inserts, oh, plus yeah. he... So it, it, for him, it was he did basically 30 setups between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. and that you guys were dismissed probably itself, around three. Anyway, he had a thankless, you know, job as. Uh, and of course, we weren't in all of them. We weren't in very much. No. Okay. This is back, by the way, Universal Studios, uh, oh, and it's the uh, account old accounting vaults. <laughs> Uh, and there's a little jump cut here in the film that is in, exists in all versions. Um, but this is, I, I don't, I, I tried to find it. I don't know if it any longer exists as the old accounting vault, but that's what appeared on the production report. Mort Mills, he, I just remember him from a lot of TV. Back in the uh, you know in the mm -hmm. '60s, again he didn't 
have a breakaway career, perhaps, but he was a very solid actor. I liked working, working Here, with him. Here's a major uh, change in the film that doesn't seem significant. When you see this door open right now, Janet, mm -hmm. first you see, okay, first you see the face at the window. That's good. Now you'll see the door open. Originally, you would see three characters coming in, and it would bring a laugh. Now all you see is a shadow. You do not mm -hmm. see their faces immediately. Much better. And much more effective. Much more effective, yeah. And all you see is Poncho. You know, so you... Yeah, so my, you just took out the entrance of the characters. So you see these three hokey kind of guys, you know, goofing <laughs> around. Yeah. Like that guy who was jumping, which, which, which would have been laughable, as you say. Yeah. Now, I'm going to answer a question that a lot of people have asked, and I think I finally found the solution to it. The voice here was not... Uh, it sounds like it might have been Wells' voice. Originally in the script, it looks like that off-screen voice was supposed to have been uh, Grandy mm -hmm. saying, Hey, Tanya, but he, Wells changed it for some reason. Mm -hmm. But that was who was originally scripted to say the word, Hey, Tanya. So even he was going to be involved in this Tanya thing in some way. Hmm. Back to Dennis. Uh, that would have, so in some way, that seems to me would have taken away from Tanya because uh, if he were, because I think, you know, down, oh, this is, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, her, she has two shots in this film. I know it, but look at her. And these are the guys that you would have seen coming yeah. through the door. Yeah, like see, and that's what ride. was wrong, would have been wrong. Look at her. I mean, it's... <laughs> the sandwich in the mouth and the radio. It's... This, is, this is trouble. Now, Phil Bowles told me that there was... A, and here's, here's a myth that we can uh, dispose of. He said there was a double here for you, but there isn't That's a double. That's not true. That's not true. You can see it. No. That is me. That is you. I know it's me because they were, if you think about it, you never see the, the bad arm because they, mm -hmm. were, they, they, they grabbed the bad arm and never moved that. They just moved the good one. Because they knew the, about the good that you broken it. Yeah. 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 Okay, now this and, is... Uh, no, no, that was me. Yeah. Okay, this is coming up right now. One of the biggest changes that changed the whole character of uh, Joe Calera in the film. There's a famous shot where he puts his head on the table. And um, he goes into defeat too early into the picture. And by taking that shot out, which Wells thought was an annoying shot, here, honey, it changes but, the whole yeah. character. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to show you where that shot is. It changes the whole character of Calera, and everyone it, is convinced. Where it was, you mean. Where it was. Everyone is convinced that we added more lines because they pay attention to his character more. You know, it's interesting. His hands are shaking. The paper is shaking in his hands there. Right. The now watch. Um, right here. You're going to see, just watch. This is real. Walter said it was impossible to do, and I fought with him to get this shot out. And it works. Right there. That's where the shot was. You mean he put his head He back. put his head on the table there, and he folded. Mm -hmm. And then he comes back defiant like this. It just didn't work. And Wells knew it. Wasn't that the Muir Woods shot? That was, I was in the Muir Woods. I, we were editing up this up in Northern California at Walter's, and I went for a beautiful walk one day in the Muir Woods. And Walter had told me the night before there was no way the shot could come out. So, and it had to the, come out. Uh, and I went for a walk at 9 a.m., and the sun is sh shining through the tall trees. And um, uh, it, 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 It's as much to a spiritual it's a experience cathedral. that I had ever had. And all I could see was Joe Calera's head. Menzies' his head on a table. And it totally destroyed this great morning. And I went to Walter and said, Walter, you have to take, take this out. shot <laughs> out. And he said, but I can't take this shot out. It's impossible to do. And I said, but you're Walter Murch. Take this <laughs> shot out. And Mr. Gorbachev, I mean, tear he, down this wall. <laughs> he, he wouldn't talk to me all day. And now we realize, after watching the entire film, that the shot had to come out to keep this character alive to the end. Oh, yeah. yeah, because if, if he had folded, the, the, it would have been, or the, you would have known what was going to happen. Exactly. You would have, you would have realized he was going to fold early on. 
And this is, to me, this, this scene always gives me chills to be that far out there alone with the wind blowing and everything else. It just seems like a... It was a cold night, too. According, Always cold out there in the desert at night. Phil Bowles, the AD, said he remembers this night being a very long night and said that his feet hurt. He remembers his feet hurt, hurting after uh, doing this, and he said that his feet still hurt when he thinks about this night. So he must have been very active that night out there well, as an AD. Well, there was a lot of work that we did out there, you know, because it started out there in the afternoon, and then we went through and the change. Went yeah, into the we night. went from the arrival clear through the afternoon into the dead of night. Yeah, it's well, you're it, you're in most of it. I'm just in this bit at the end. All right, look at the shadows. Yeah, yeah. It's just. Yeah, no matter where you look, there is a sh the shadows and the ceilings. The ceilings that he established early on with Kane. I was just going to say that he was, the, I believe, supposed to be the first director that used yeah. the ceilings. You can find him in early films, but not throughout an entire film the way he did. And um, when you see what he did here with not only showing the ceiling, but making it an intricate part of the, of the whole story mm -hmm. as far as setting the tone and the mood... Now you go out here and you're going to cabin number seven. There was that party. <laughs> it's a mask. Oh. <laughs> well, they think I'm going to clean it up. They are not that Okay. Dumb. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little about the makeup? Uh, my makeup? Yeah. Well, obviously, I dyed my hair black and grew a mustache and dyed that black and put it a little uh, uh, olive makeup, olive-colored makeup. And But the thing I, I regret not doing, though I suggested it to Orson, I said, you know, I should, uh, I should have just a touch of an Hispanic accent in this. He said, no, no, no. He said, that, don't bother with that, Chuck. He said, uh, you're the son of a rich Mexican family. You're going to be president of Mexico one day, and you were educated at Stanford and Hartford Law, uh, Harvard Law, and you speak flawless English. Now, no one who is not born speaking English speaks flawless English, and no, it would I, be a good Chuck, touch. Chuck, you no. know, I, I, I really feel... Um, I feel strongly about this because there's a, um, a, a, a boy, a young man, 30, uh, who works in Bob's office, and he was born um, uh, in Mexico but came here like at one or something and uh, great, went you know, through college, took all the, uh, the NASD tests, everything. He does not speak with an accent. Honest hmm. to gosh. That's Bob, your husband, right? Right. Bob, my husband's ha in his office. And he... Th oh, that's the young, amazing. Because, yeah, honest uh, to gosh. Even I can always tell if someone's a Brit or, or an Australian or a New Zealander. I can that, but, um, but this... Um, <laughs> the marijuana. Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, watch this. There's a shot coming up when you're going to see the two walk that the continuity is broken. But because it's Wells and because the, it, what's going on is so interesting, no one ever notices it unless you well, point it out. Point it out to me now. It, it was when, uh, you have to watch it, it's when they were going to cabin number seven. Oh, yes. Talking, oh, sure, I know what you mean. Yes. Where you're left to right and then you're right yeah, to left. Yeah. That's lovely. And now we're going to say goodbye to Dennis Weaver, who gave a brilliant performance oh, in this film. Look at, look at him. Look at the hat and the, everything. I mean, how many characters do you think uh, this inspired in films over the years? <laughs> Look at that. That's wonderful. Now, I love the screech here as we were coming around. <laughs> Looks like that's up in Mulholland. Yeah, you see that like. balcony? Well, 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 wait till we get to the car shot. But that balcony, it's no longer, though, 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 it's no longer there, but you can still see the girders in that building if you go down to Venice and take a look. You got time to rest? Yeah, we are There's an interesting thing here on this shot that uh, Wells had asked for. The, when after Tamaroff um, is offed uh, and you see his head, Wells had asked that the second shot of his head be trimmed by about 10 frames. And if you watched it with the, the way it originally played, they kind of laughed at this kind of head.
gaggling over the uh, bed. Mm -hmm. But when you cut it to 10 frames and it just, I mean, it's like that. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. And it it yeah. changes the whole reaction to an audience. When you, so you're sitting there with a thousand people watching it like I did in uh, Toronto, and it jolt, they get that jolt. It's quite an amazing experience. Yes, it's. Uh... So it's quite a uh, quite an amazing experience, uh, but that will be coming up sooner. He discussed that shot, and this is Orson Welles, and he also discussed that edit early on in memos that I found from uh, June of 1957. And this was obviously done at the studio, mm -hmm. uh, Janet. Yes, but at night. At night, at the yeah, studio? that's what I said. That once we had started on that night schedule, it was very hard to switch back to days. So even though we weren't on location, we kept the night schedule because of the turnaround time, the loss of time. Yeah, you know, otherwise you know. you'd lose almost a whole day. Now this is your only scene with Orson in the entire movie. Orson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you never see Janet with Orson up until this point. You're uh, Chuck. No. You're with him. Oh, yeah. But I, Janet's never with him. She's always with uh, Grandy. I was in. Uh, and even when you're with him now, you're not conscious. she doesn't have any dialogue in this. <laughs> but when I spoke to Janet early on, and you said, well, you remembered him being there every moment because he directed you. Well, of course. <laughs> and also, I, I keep thinking of the rehearsal time because I, it, that was a very precious time. And, and uh, uh, the two weeks before, we actually um, began shooting. And... Uh, uh, that was a treasure because I, I felt I really saw his mind at work. I saw him, th he, you know, thinking and creating with 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 all of us, and and it was that was an exciting time for me. The this is very good scene. Chuck, do you remember the rehearsals a lot at, at this point, working with him those two weeks prior? I don't remember two weeks. We had uh, yeah. one long Sunday, and some certainly some other time. I didn't remember it as two no, weeks. It was, it was two weeks, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was wonderful because it, it, Akeem and you and um, Orson and myself, and we were, um, you know, it was like you were kind of creating as we went along. It, it, it was very special to me. I guess that's why I'm so explicit about it, because yeah. I just... Just being a part of that kind of process uh, with minds like all of yours, it was just uh, an incredible for well, me. Well, for any one of the uh, parties in there to be with those, uh, the other three parties in that room, uh, just, was Calera there as well? Or? No. No, it was just Akeem, uh, Chuck, uh, Orson, and myself. Yeah. Akeem and Wells were, were fairly close, from what I can see, from all their collaboration on previous pictures. And of course, Joe Kalea was had worked with him, too, I think. No, 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 this was, this, this was it. Ah, oh, well, then that explains it. It was an actor that he had a lot of respect for. And if you watch this film, it's all really greatly Kalea's film. It's Menses's film, because he's the character that's introduced early on, and you follow him throughout. You follow him through everything. And he is the one totally good soul in the film. Well, and always, also, they say that uh, the important thing in a character, whether it's interesting or not, is does he change? And Joe right. Kalea changes. Because your character... See, is, my character remains the same. So does Orson's. So does, so does Janet's. But, but Kalea's Joe Kalea changed. changes. Changes dra dramatically. Uh, it's, it's a performance that, as you watch this film, the more... Mm -hmm. And more as I have, you know, you, you really you really grow to appreciate him as an actor. Yes, he's very good. Wonderful to act with. I had two or three scenes with him. And now, this is the first time uh, you might have before, Chuck, but for me, it was the first time I had ever done a scene or seen a scene shot with a, uh, an, is it emo or IMO camera, a handheld camera. Well, this was the yeah. same camera that he had uh, used in the elevator. And probably Phil Lathrop was the operator. Well, I wasn't in the elevator, but so for yeah. me, it was the first time I had ever seen a handheld uh, uh, camera used. Like, to see, you can, you can get such really good shots. And it greatly inspired, the, this film greatly inspired uh, Truffaut and Godard and the, you know, the French New Wave movement that was to follow very soon after. Um, Andre Buzan uh, readdressed the final chapter of his last book. 
about this film because he felt it was so important. You've got the flashing lights, you've got the, you know, the, the bizarre, see how the, the handheld can get, you just feel you're there. And here... You can the, see it. They put some kind of tongue in his mouth, too. Do you remember if it was a... That he did not want his tongue, I think it was a hog's tongue. I don't, I don't, that I don't know. But here comes that flashing shot, also a great little freeze on the uh, door. Yeah. Do you, did you forget anything? Just a frame or two. Okay. I just have to go through this right here and watch. Now watch this right here. Just. Just enough. To just really. enough. Mm -hmm. And yeah, now. You want more. Okay, you see. Okay, that balcony. To get to that balcony, the room inside, there was a guy there drunk, oh, on the, laying on the bed drunk. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, in order for me My to get word, to the balcony, yeah, we had to go through terrible. that. Oh, it was awful. The, the, I had two guys with me, obviously, the whole time, and they stayed in the room in case yeah. he woke up or something. Yeah, that, and that, as I say, you can go down to Venice and actually see where that balcony was. Um, I, I, I love this. The wife is in jeopardy, and the husband's on his way to... to save her, uh, say, doesn't, say, even, see doesn't her. even see her. And now you're going to hit somebody. What? Watch this. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> you were in a hurry. You were in yes. a hurry. And this, again, is a, another great scene. We had to tweak it a little and trim it uh, at one point uh, during the bar scene. I'm sorry. You had we, to we had to trim it a little. He uh -huh. asked for. He was afraid that Vargas would be standing around too long at the end of the shot with egg on his face, mm -hmm. and so we trimmed it like six or seven frames, and it just works more fluidly. Right scene here. at the end of the yeah. scene here, yeah. Uh, you were just standing there too long mm -hmm. before uh, Schwartz comes, you know, to uh, to to help you. Again, here we are with the source music. And I talked to Valentin de Vargas. Uh, he's living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And earlier on in the film, uh, in the Grandy uh, scene with uh, you, Janet, uh, he forgot to put a shh in the film. And Valentin was gracious enough to go to a local radio station and give us that shh. <laughs> and it, I found it existed in the memo and in the script that Wells had asked for this I don't believe thing. I could do that shot now, either, Karen. <laughs> wow, look at that. pretty small, but... <laughs> yeah. Look. Now, the two... It's interesting, though, two Hispanics, and he's asking you to speak English. Uh, yeah. but little, <laughs> Curious. A little uh, grammatic license there. And, uh, okay, now this is where you'll find uh, that you were standing, as I say, right right there. You see you're standing there? Oh, and Now then, yes. we got him in just a little good. sooner. Just Very good. So yeah, so there. yeah. It's too much the hero at bay if you hold it too long. Now we're going to go to a scene where the camera pulls focus. And in the original version that Wells had seen on uh, December 4th, 1957, when he wrote this 58-page memo. He complained that he spent so much time getting this camera go out of focus, and they just cut. They just cut, so uh, now here it comes. And he said he spent a great deal of time getting, perfecting this shot. Just like that. Very good. So that Very was... Very good. He wanted that, and now we're going to see Joe Cotton again, and Joe Cotton's now going to have his voice. His own voice. He's going to have Joe Cotton actually speaking his own line. And It's all down in the report. The found evidence of a mixed party. There he is. Mixed party? Articles of clothing, half-smoked reefers, needle marks. Something else could produce the same effects. Demerol, for instance, or sodium pentothal. You could smell this stuff on her. We just had to keep silence over Joe Cotton. Brilliant actor. I, I think to a lot, to us Wellsians, 
who have followed his career, you know, a great actor. To others, they, I don't think people have recognized really what a brilliant actor he was. Oh, yes, he did. Uh, maybe his work in Kane was the best work. Uh, but, third uh, Man. Third Man. Oh, yes. Uh, third yeah. Man. Yeah, third Absolutely man. fabulous. Um, this is where Wells wanted Menzies to really start collapsing. He wanted. You saw it in the close-up. Uh, right. He wanted it during these close-ups, when all of a sudden he realizes that Hank Quinlan is not the man he thought he was, and that he's got he has to do his job. The, and again, he's with the cane and reinstating that story. And this was the shot that we made in the basement of the hotel, and he woke up Joe to to get it. To make it. Really? They were in the, ba the basement of the. We were down there peeing in a corner, Orson and I, because there were no, almost no bathrooms in the place. And he said, What a great set this would be. He said, We ought to do this show scene with you and Joe. And I said, Well, Christ, they've got a set all built. I think we're doing it Monday. He said, No, 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 this is much better. We'll get Joe down here. Wake him up. And he said to an AD. And I said, Orson, he'll be sound asleep. He'll forget his lines. He said, that's fine. He'll be better. <laughs> he was. <laughs> and it's, We'd shot this about 3 in the morning. This is the kind of performance that would get you in a uh, supporting actor nomination these days. Oh, yes. It's a wonderful job. Uh, I found memos that you really tried to get this film to con back in uh, 58 that you That's, really yeah, you did. know tried to champion this film and have it be recognized for the work that you believed it was to no avail though I was not successful no. <laughs> it won best film that year in 1958 at the Belgium uh, yeah. World's Fair and Wells statement was whoever at Universal sent it there must have gotten fired after that one I found the chair he's sitting in it's in the prop room at Universal that chair. that chair. That chair is there. Are you serious? Yep, it's there. Oh, my gosh. Um, we have a small change that's going to come up here, but this is definitely, as I say, it was that one night that he shot with Dietrich, and he got so much out of that night. Without her character, I don't know what kind of film this would have been. Not as good. <laughs> well, and it, it wasn't originally, there wasn't that much to it. I can't even remember if there was anything to it. I, I'm Did not the sure there was exist? either. But Did the part I, exist? it seems to me that there was some reference. I, I, mm. I, I, I'd have to. Um, but it just grew. I mean, it just like topsy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, and this was shot in Santa Monica. This wasn't Venice. Uh, the, the porch oh. and this house. Oh, this. The house was uh, on... Because the canal is, is yeah, Venice. It belonged, yes. to, it belonged to the uh, electric company. Hmm. And um, I found the original location reports. We are uh, Jonathan Rosenbaum and I are right now in the process of, and it might be out by the time you've heard this uh, commentary. It might have been out 25 years later after you've heard this commentary, depending on how long it lasts or how long this uh, product stays out. But uh, we're doing a book on that is going to reprint the entire memo along with um, a lot of the production notes mm -hmm. so that people can study this film in greater detail. Good idea. Uh, University of California Press usually keeps their books out for about 20, 25 years. And since it's uh, being done in conjunction with Universal, I figure we might as well give a plug for the book. Sure, absolutely. And also, there, your book also has great accounts of this film. Uh, which one? Your, your uh, journal. And, but I mean, at the time or at the, the time, later yeah, book? Yeah. In your journal, you report quite a no, bit about this no. film. Yeah, and, and your, Jana, bi you, your biography. My autobiography does as well. So there, there is... It gives what's happening at home as well as what's happening on the set. <laughs> what know, was happening sure at home? For, well, I had a, a six-month-old baby, so, you know, I was trying to be a mommy and work nights and with a broken arm, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> was that Kelly? Yeah. Yeah. Who's been uh, traveling yeah, with you during a, uh, a lot of the press on this film. I know it, uh, it's especially like Toronto and, you know, New York, yeah. Cannes. Very good actress. I got to see her uh, film yeah, I know, recently. you went down to see yeah, it, yes. Very good actress. 
been doing there. Okay, there's a shot. There's, there's a shot of Dietrich here when Wells leaves that he wanted to be inserted that wasn't in the original cut. Mm -hmm. And it, when you watch it, you'll see that it just changes, again, the emotion just slightly. Not enough to make it too significant, but enough to, you know, Which make it more of his it? film. As he's walking out the door. Why don't you go home? Uh, it will come up uh, when we cut back into there. And all these oil rigs are gone now in Venice. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah. Great things to shoot on that work for the scene. Well, I've heard that some of them are still de there, but they're disguised, but it's, uh, it's definitely not the same. Uh, Curtis Hansen, who directed the movie L.A. Confidential, at the end of his film, he had some oil rigs, and he has always said that this film was a great inspiration to mm -hmm. his really? uh, yeah. career. And there's a documentary on the uh, DVD, and Laserdisc, and uh, Curtis appears on it. I think giving a slight tour of Venice. Mm -hmm. His grandfather lived down there. Okay, now watch. Here we go. Is that it? That's it. He wanted that shot in there. Originally, she looked at him when he was drunk in front of her, uh, sitting at the table. And now it's as he's leaving. So. Originally, uh, uh, we really didn't get into the memo that much. Originally, what happened was on December 4th, 1957, Orson was invited to take a look at a cut of Touch of Evil. Mm -hmm. And he went in by himself and without taking a single note, went home that evening and wrote 58 pages. And he sent it to, uh, and, and the pa it was a memo that basically was to go to an editorial department just to tweak the film enough to make it a little more commercial play a little better and he sent a copy to you and he sent a copy to uh, Edward Mull mm -hmm. I believe who was the who head was of the studio then he, he head of the studio yeah and Edward M you were his ally but Edward Mull was the one who controlled the purse yeah, uh, strings and Edward Mull uh, wrote a very nice telegram to Wells the next day saying that he would address the majority of the changes very quickly with Ernest Nims, who was working on post-production with him. And Ernest Nims had been, who at that time was working with Universal, had earlier worked with Orson on The Stranger. He was the editor oh, yes. on The Stranger. So Orson, I think before he went to Europe, really felt that everything was in good shape. Also, he was invited back in to do some uh, loops. And uh, I think they wanted both Orson to come back in and you to come back in. Do you remember going in in December with Orson? Not with Orson. I had a meeting with Orson before I went to see Mall because they then, that was when they had scheduled the retakes, the, the, the right. color retakes. And I said, I can't do this without, I talked to Mall and he was very polite, but he said, uh, no, we, we're not going to put him back on. And then I went to my lawyer and my agent and said, well, then I won't do the shots. He says, no, you have to do the shots. The guild, SAG, requires that you do the shots. So I did the shots. But uh, then I didn't see Orson after that until years later. And Well, Chuck, isn't it true that it's when you uh, question doing the, the uh, you know, the extra shots, no, the added, added shots. shots that we were asked to do and that we, we didn't, but you, uh, we had been called for Monday's work, and you said on Sunday, you said, I won't report to for work until I can talk to Mr. Mull. And then and they push yeah that's right and then and so what happened was that you had to you were a pretty stand up guy because you uh, took the responsibility for the crew call that day yeah I paid for the crew call yeah. which of course was which, only about you know, seven thousand um, dollars it'd be a lot more than that now but uh, and those receipts do exist in the they uh, do. in the files uh -huh. at USC uh, uh, well there you are you know th there's proof that that story is yeah. you're very accurate on that and um, that. It was the actors that stood up for Wells and the technicians. The actors was, loved him. His crews loved him. But the, it was the, it, maybe a sound man didn't love him. Well, uh, I guess that's true. I, I, with one uh, exception. But I mean, most <laughs> of the except crews. in post production. Well, yeah. I think everyone but, had that esprit de corps of working with someone who was 
that this, talented, this yeah. talent, talented man, and that we felt a part of, of a creative process that was very exciting. Yeah, it was. And, and he was an interesting man to be around. You oh, know, aside constantly. from his skill as a director, his gifts, he was just interesting. Well, Edward Malt, uh, who's still alive and uh, 92 years old, told me that when I asked him about the Sanchez apartment and what his reaction was to the seven pages being shot in one day, he said, ah, it was a show-off. <laughs> well, in a sense, he was, was, because he did that on purpose to show them what he could do, and they thought he'd do it every day or so. But, yeah. and of course, he never did it again. It sounds like he, saying, well, there were too many notes, yeah. <laughs> like an armadillo. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes know, too uh, many, exactly like that scene. You know, this bridge no longer exists, but there is a recon there's a new bridge that sits exactly where this one was, yeah. and the water still is muddy and it, it dirty. Really schmucky yeah, place that must to have work. Been fun to you know walk around in. <laughs> yeah, all night long. Oh, <laughs> okay. And, and it had to be freezing. Yeah, it was. It, well, let's see. That was. Uh, it was uh, April. April. I was going to say April. So it wasn't. It was the water was not. You know, the water was cold. The night was not terribly cold. The, the, um, this is lovely scene. One of the reasons that attracted me to Walter Murch as editor on this project, I had seen at the L.A. County Museum, um, Ian Bernier over there, the coordinator, had put together a sound lecture. Mm -hmm. And he had Walter uh, Murch speak and explain what he had done on Apocalypse Now and then on Walter's Probably his baby, one of his first real prize projects, was a film called A Conversation with that Francis with, Floyd uh, Coppola did with Gene G Hackman. Gene Hackman, yeah. And it was all to do with radio bugging and this whole thing. And I thought that this man understood not only picture editing, but he understood yes. how this was supposed to play out. And I figured if anyone could get this scene the way Wells wanted it, as far as the sound design goes, it would be Walter Murch. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know... Yeah. Lo and behold, he was able he to. Did. He did. He, he just read what Wells had asked for in sound designs, and he said that he had never seen a director that was so intricate as far as what he wanted. Yeah. And he was, right, he had developed things in 57 and 58 and 58 in this memo that he thought he had invented for The Godfather and American Graffiti mm -hmm. back in the 70s. He was just copying. And he said he didn't realize, you know, yeah. if, if he's going to. Uh, find out that someone else had originally developed it. Might as well be Orson Welles, and a great compliment yeah. to Walter. Yes, on that. Um, it was extraordinary. All this work here. Yeah, it's because when you think how antiquated that uh, recorder is, <laughs> the wire—it was a wire recorder. You know, that's what they used yeah. then. Dragging the uh, wires in the mm -hmm. water there, yeah. you can get electrocuted <laughs> doing things like that. Uh, compared to today's technology. Uh, didn't um, you tell me, Rick, that also, like, Walter Murch, who um, uh, w was asked to do the main biggest pictures in, in you know, in, in the uh, industry and actually turned down quite a, a big picture? Uh, well, he had been offered the horse whisperer that, uh, the same, that's right, same, that around the, the same time as Touch of Evil, and he turned down the horse whisperer and said, I oh, will do Touch of Evil. And uh, this is a well. man with a lot of integrity uh, as far as... In order to do this. And this is, is a film... Uh, his work on this film is, is going to be remembered. I'm sorry, uh, Bob Redford, but this film will probably be remembered a lot longer. Uh, yeah, I think Horse so. Horse Whisperer was a nice film, but this is uh, definitely a project that needed Walter, and... Um, well, I'm glad you got him. Oh, yeah, he... I'm, he works standing up, too, at, at, at his avid. He doesn't sit down when he works. He mm -hmm. works seven days a week. Standing up. 18 hours a day, standing up, and... Mm doesn't leave the project. He works standing up? He works standing up. And, um... So did Hemingway. At a barn in Northern California overlooking a great uh, lagoon that he shares with the Audubon Society. I mean, you told me about the uh, location. Yeah, first day we worked, there was a rainbow over the lagoon, and I... Working with Touch of Evil and seeing rainbows, it just seemed too unreal. An omen. I feel Orson was watching down on this project, you know. He, you know, it was like when we were up there and we got extra an extra 12-page memo and an extra 9-page sound memo. It was like the faxes were coming in from him. 
you know, he was faxing us and saying, more changes, more. We, we, we thought we were done, and it was like, more, more. More input, more input. <laughs> they say that he uh, never would, you know, finalize anything. And, How could you arrest me here? Yeah, I think Mike. this is true. This is where you're going to die. Little, there are a couple little things that we did here that he, that he asked for. Uh, which we can go through this shot here. Um, if you look at the trailer, there's a little alternative of that gunshot. Uh, oh. But this is, we stayed with the original. Um, Harry Keller shot, did the reshoot of when you and uh, Janet get back together again. That was a Harry Keller shot that will be coming up. Now, when we come up here, you'll watch, here's the hat going down, that react, this, this reaction is a little uh, tweak here. Is she there? Did you bring my wife? And now when Wells looks up here, watch right now, that's new. Mm -hmm. that's, that's new in the shot good. he wanted to hear. Menzies is dead. You know, he's laying down there by the recorder. He wanted to make sure Wells heard that was happening. Now we have Quinlan a, heard it. Quinlan heard it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Getting a little excited here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, originally, the radio would close after Quinlan's body fell into the water. Now the radio closes before Quinlan falls into the water. So, again, Quinlan sees what happens. It's the popular phrase this year, they come to closure on that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. There okay. we are. He loved the shot of um, Dietrich coming over the bridge. He said it was one of the finest things he had ever done. Uh, okay, here we go with the close. Now, here. Was it? Okay. And you'll see. Okay, this is... Okay, there. The radio closed. Now he goes in the water. It used to close after he went in the water. His famous intuition was right after all. He framed that Mexican kid, Santos, but he didn't even need to. The kid confessed about that bomb. So, turns out... Now we're back here at... Uh, uh, March uh, 12th of 1957, uh, you know, in the middle of the shoot, Marlon Dietrich's day. And Wells always intended that the um, credits come right after the, uh, after her exit as she was fading in the background. And I think Dietrich sums it up pretty oh, much yes. here. Cop. He was some kind of a man. And I think you guys would agree with the oh, same. Absolutely. Oh, yes. It's, uh, one need, should not be surprised that Marlene Dietrich gave a good performance, though. No. <laughs> uh, Especially having worked with Orson, or known him at least very well. Yeah, no, she... They had worked together on a magic show during the, uh, the yeah. war years for the USO, and... Uh, That's when I first met Orson, was when he was doing a magic show for the national playing fields of Great Britain in England. Yeah. And... Now here we come with the credits. Uh, you know, one thing that I wanted to say is that we've been very lucky with this project. We've had people like Jonathan and Walter. Who is